Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Miss Irene Dunn in Edna Ferber's Cimarron on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories, chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Welcome to our new series on the Hallmark Playhouse. Tonight, we present one of the great American stories, Edna Ferber's Cimarron. When I first read it, it came to me, as perhaps to many others, as a window opening on the great conception of an expanding America, an expansion which reached a climax on September 18th, 1889, when the Cimarron country of Oklahoma was opened up to the throng of waiting settlers. It is this tremendous story that Miss Ferber tells with great skill, and I'd rather think that no living American writer has done more than Miss Ferber to open up this vast territory of fiction. In our story tonight, we have the especial privilege of bringing to you one of Hollywood's most celebrated stars, Miss Irene Dunn. But before we begin, here is Frank Goss, who has a brief message from Hallmark. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar, for birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying name on the back, Hallmark. Well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. And now we raise the curtain on Hallmark Playhouse, starring Irene Dunn as Sabre Cravat in Edna Ferber's Cimarron. The Cimarron. It is a county, a river. It is a legend and a reality. It is the fabric of my life. For I dreamed of it, then feared and hated it, and finally came to love it. It is Oklahoma. Strange when you look back the things that measure off the years for you. I can look back and count the years of my growth and my country's growth by sounds. I hear a clock measuring the moments, and I close my eyes and I'm back in my mother's great stately house in Wichita. I open a music box, and once more I'm sitting on the floor of that house with my young son beside me. What did Daddy say when he gave you the music box? Oh, Sim, I've told you so many times. I like the story. <laughs> well, Daddy said... Here, let's close the box, shall we? Daddy said, I saw this and I thought you might fancy it as a wedding present. And I said, my goodness, who am I marrying? And Daddy said, me. And I said, who would marry you? And Daddy said, any girl in the territory. Was he telling the truth? Oh, Daddy always tells the truth. So naturally, I had to marry him right away before some other girl in the territory got him. If some other girl had got him, where would I be? Well, you see... <clears throat> well, uh, I'll explain that to you when you're a little older. I want to know now. <laughs> oh, Yancy. No other girl in the territory would have gotten me. Once I had a look at your oh, mother. Oh, Yancy. Daddy, Daddy. Hello, son. Sabra, what is all this ridiculous nonsense about you going to the Cimarron? I'm going wherever Yancey goes, Mother. Yancey, it's time you'd settle down someplace. Why can't you be content to run that newspaper of yours and conduct your law practice in Wichita? Because there's nothing to fight in Wichita. There's no more wilderness. Osage is a frontier town. That's where I'm going to start my newspaper. No daughter of mine is going traipsing off into the wilderness in boots and calico and sunbonnets. Wichita was wilderness when you came to it, Mother. And you brought to Wichita what I'll take to Osage. I'll make a home for my husband. I'll raise my children. We'll make the land yield for us. We'll put our roots into the earth and our home upon it. 
And when I'm your age, I'll have in Osage what you have in Wichita. Darling, I've suddenly realized why it could be you and no other from the moment I saw you. Oh, Yancey. I've suddenly realized why I always come back, no matter where I go. Why, Yancey? Because you're the wife of my heart uh, and my dreams. Yes, I can measure the years of my growth by sounds. Horses' hooves and wheels rolling westward and the droning punctuation of insects and birds and sometimes an animal in the distance. And my husband's singing as he led us into the wilderness. It was adventure and excitement during the day, and if at night I wept, thinking of the cool green grasses and the gardens of home, he didn't know, and the tears were dry by morning. And then one evening, Yancey stopped the wagons and pointed with his wagon whip to something that looked like a wallow of mud, dotted with crazy shanties and tents. There it is, Sabra. There's our future home. Sounds of that first night I spent in Osage. Yancey found us a room above a saloon and disappeared as soon as he got us into it. I lay there in the dark, listening. Yancey! 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 Hey, what's the matter? What's oh, wrong? Oh, Yancey! Why aren't you asleep? Asleep? What were all those shots and the screaming and the men hollering? Why, Sugar, what's happened to my pioneer woman? Well, I certainly didn't know this was pioneering. I expected to put up with scalpings and famine and flood, but I certainly didn't expect anything like, like <laughs> this. What are you laughing at? I'm laughing at you. Now, see, Because Yancey... you're the most delightful woman that was ever created. You know, Yancey, someday I'm liable to get very angry with you. Yes, but not tonight, darling. Not tonight. <laughs> Sounds that my heart had quickened to and treasured and listened for over and over. Yancey's footsteps on an Oklahoma street as we walked on our first morning. He wore his fine Texas star boots and a Prince Albert coat and a snow white sombrero. He was handsome. Lord, he was handsome. Darling. You notice the way everybody's staring at you? Elegance is rare out here. Yancey, you're going to be very careful what you print in the paper, aren't you? Careful? Me? Did you know that Tom Carter, the last man who tried to run a paper out here, was found shot right through the heart? Uh, not through the center, though. The bullet barely pierced the heart. It was sloppy shooting. Well, sloppy shooting or not, he wasn't able to write about it the next day. You know what the first item I'm going to write in my paper is going to be? I'm going to find out who killed Carter and print it. But they'll kill you, too. Not a chance. I'm the quickest draw in the territory. Yancey! Those dirty buzzers, they shot my hat clean off my head. Where are you going, Yancey? You stand right where you are, Sabra. I'm going to pick up my hat. Oh, Yancey, I wish you wouldn't. Don't worry, Sabra. I'm just going to bend down and get my hat. Oh! Yancey! Yancey, you shot him! Quit yelling, Lon. I just nipped your ear. Can't you take a joke, Yancey? Sure, I can take a joke, and I can perform a few jokes myself. I'll get you for this, Yancey. If your missus wasn't Don't with you... Don't you call me Mrs. Lon, whatever your name is. Oh. You're a lot of miserable, good-for-nothing loafers. That's what you are, oh. shooting at people on the streets. Oh. You leave my husband alone. Oh. I declare I have a notion to box your ears. My ears? Oh, no, not my ears. No! And don't you ever let me catch you shooting at my husband again. Sabra. What did you want to do a thing like that for? Well, somebody had to take a hand. Oh, by tomorrow, everyone in the territory will be saying that Yancey Cravat is hiding behind his wife's petticoats. But you didn't. They can't say so. You shot him very nicely in the ear, darling. Now, come on. Let's continue our walk. We're never going to find a house to live in at this rate. Would you like to tote the guns, Mrs. Cravat? No, Mr. Cravat. I don't need a gun to handle the Cimarron. Shall we go on? <laughs> Thank you. 
we found a four-room house. And Yancey bought a two-room cabin made of rough boards and had it hauled and plastered to the main house. We had a sitting room, a dining room, a bedroom, and a kitchen to live in. And the rooms of the cabin became a combination law and newspaper office, a composing room, and a print shop. And another sound clamored its way into my everlasting memories. The Osage wigwam's gossipy clatter as she came off the press. Well, she'll soon be out now. Yancey, what are you doing with that gun? Cutting a notch in it. Cutting a notch? Poor Lon. He isn't going to be able to read in the papers about the way he murdered Carter. You killed him? You killed a man? Would you rather he had killed me? It was one of the other of us. And somehow, I thought you'd rather have me around than him. Yancey. Yancey. Week after week, month after month, and finally, we were counting years by the editions of the paper. I began to print things for the women readers, recipes and fashions and stories. Curtains began to appear in the Osage windows, and the houses were painted, and the grass and flowers began to grow. It wasn't Wichita, but it was going to be. And though it hadn't the elegance of Wichita yet, it had become one thing that Wichita would never be again for me. It was home. Sounds, sounds, sounds. Carriages and wagons tearing down the roads. Storms, thunder, rains, winds, winds. The wind. Oh, the sound of the wind the day my second child was born. It screamed and ranted around the house, rattling the windows, whistling through the doors and cracks, whirling the red dust through the house. I was half out of my mind with the pain and the sound of it. Oh, what agonies a wind can blow through your memories. I hate the wind. I hate the wind! Welcome, Miss Donna. You're going to be the most beautiful girl in the West. Yancey, I've been thinking. I'm going to paper the house. Again? I like rosebuds in the bedroom and one of those new vine patterns in the parlor. Listen, sugar. President Cleveland just issued a proclamation setting September 16th for the opening of the Cherokee Strip. Oh, really? And I've been thinking of organizing another woman's club. Honey, honey, let's get out of this. Clubs, wallpaper, church suppers. Let's sell the newspaper. Take the children and head for Cherokee. Yes, no, no. You can't, you can't mean it. It's the chance of a lifetime. The biggest thing in the history of Oklahoma. That's what you said about the summer. Sabra, on. listen to me. No, I... no, I won't listen. We've worked and worked. We've got a home now. The paper's a success. It's growing. We're just beginning to be a little secure. All right, darling, all right. We'll talk about it later. Sounds awakened me the morning Yancey left. The excited shots and yells of the few other men of Osage who also had decided to make the Cherokee run. I stood there listening. Sabra, come with me. Throw whatever you can in a bag and come with me. How can I? The children... The children, too. All of us. It's not too late. We're frontier people, Sabra. We have to move on as the West moves. We're beginning to have too much. When it comes easy, it's no good, darling. Your food tastes flat and nothing you look at has any color. And a house becomes a prison. All right, Yancey. Take your claim on the Cherokee Strip. We'll be ready to go when you come back. Oh, us. Sabra, my darling, my darling. I do have my pioneer woman back after all. Hey, Yancey, come on! Goodbye, sugar. I sat there quite alone. And then my son came into the room and raised the lid on the music box. And the box tore at me with almost human fingers. Suddenly it was unbearable. I pushed it off the table. 
Oh, Yancy. Oh, Yancy! Before Mr. Hilton introduces the second act of Cimarron, the story he's chosen for tonight, will you join me at an after-theater party? It's in honor of a famed playwright. Among the guests, a young writer was just overheard asking a question of a friend of the author. Sir, the young writer asked respectfully, how is it that your author friend knows just what to write about? How does he know what people will like? The man thinks deeply for a moment and then answers, he is a successful playwright because he knows the things in people's hearts and takes the care to write about them simply and honestly. In those words was revealed a secret of the greatness of William Shakespeare, dean of all the world's writers. Those who make hallmark cards believe that the bonds of friendship are created and cemented by an extra measure of understanding, of knowing what is in people's hearts. That's why for every occasion, a Hallmark card always seems to have an extra measure of warmth and sincerity. Yes, every Hallmark card seems to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. That's why, too, your Hallmark card is always received with such pleasure. For when your friends turn the card over, as you did, and see the name Hallmark, they'll know you cared enough to send the very best. <laughs> Now we continue with part two of Cimarron, starring Irene Dunn as Sabre Cravat. I ran the paper for the next five years with the help of Jesse Rickey, the best printer in the Southwest. And believe me, they were five years of reform. I was fighting for the day when Osage could take its place in the sun with Wichita and Kansas City and Chicago and San Francisco. I wrote editorials about the loafers on the Pahuska Avenue corners. I denounced politicians. I fought for law and order and the sanctity of the home. And the days of those years were measured in sound. Chilling, terrifying sound of fire. Where are the children, Mrs. Cravat? The office and the house are both Donna, on fire. Sim, hurry, hurry. Where are you? Donna, Sim, the house is on fire. We some more blankets. We need more blankets. We're going Here to get the fire out. Donna, Sim. The children are outside, Mrs. Cravat. Thank God, thank God. Here, take all the blankets. How did it start? The building was soaked all around in coal oil. Someone planned this fire. Come on now, get outside. Put it out. Or oh, the music box. Help me with the music box. All right, box. here. Let me help you with it. And then the shouting silence of absolute stillness that followed. It was so quiet that my ears ached for sound. I sat there on the front steps, unable to move. Mother. Yes, Sim. It was Mongold who set fire to the house. It was because you were writing editorials against his saloon. There's a posse after him. No one would have dared set that fire if my father had been here. No, probably not. Do you think you'll ever come back? Do you, Mother? Yes, Sim. Yes, I do. Sounds. Sounds that you've lain awake through long, black, merciless hours, praying to hear. Sounds. I can't believe it. Yancey, I simply can't believe that you would come back after five years and now want to leave again. But I've enlisted with Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. I was lucky to get here at all. There's a oh, war on. Yancey, Yancey. Darling, you're so beautiful. Even more beautiful than I remembered. Come here, Sabre. No, don't, Yancey. You're my wife. I was your wife five years ago. Yancey, 
Doesn't your home, your family mean anything? Yes, they do. That's why I came back. But, Sabra, honey, there's a mighty difference between you and me. You're in love with houses. I'm in love with horizons. We had the same dream once. I thought we did. No. We shared the same love. That's been our blessing and our tragedy, darling. For it will always bring me back to you, but I'm afraid it will never keep me here. Love is my whole existence. To you, it's an interlude, isn't it? No, it's, it's something I carry with me wherever I go. Remember how the knights of the round table wore their ladies' colors wherever they went? That's how I carry your love. But I want you to stay. Do you want to conquer me? Or do you want to love me? If you conquer me, there'll be no love left between us. But I'll stay if you want, Sabra. No. No. Oh, Yancy. I thought it was happiness to love. Only for a few moments here and there. It is sorrow to love. And it is glory. But rarely happiness. Oh, my dearest, my darling. I do love you so much, so very much. I love you and I hate you and I worship you. And if it were today that we were starting out together, I'd still go with you. I'd still wait for you. Sabra. Sabra. Sounds. Years measured in sounds. I listened to them, thrilled to them, put them into print. The sounds of the new century coming up like thunder. <laughs> The sounds of the 20th century. century, for Yancey Cravat a deplorable century. Civilization everywhere you looked. Automobiles, airplanes, skyscrapers, and you could walk into the homes of Osage and think you were in Wichita. In fact, you could refer to the homes in Wichita as being a little outmoded now. You couldn't expect Yancey Cravat to remain long in a town like that. He was still the young, fighting pioneer spirit of the country. He had to keep hunting for new frontiers. New horizons. I missed him. I yearned for him. I prayed for him. But I had learned how to live alone. Completely alone. For the children were grown and married now. I thought I had heard all the sound you could hear in a lifetime. But there were more to come. <laughs> The voice of the drill, the pump, the blast, and then the rich black oil gushing from the red soil of Oklahoma. Their sounds were the birth cries of the metropolis. Osage, Oklahoma, overnight was a metropolis. <laughs> Osage Wigwam was the important newspaper of the town, and I, heaven help me, was elected congresswoman from Oklahoma. And where was Yancey Cravat? What frontier had he found? I had not known for years. And then one day, I was showing a group of senators and newspaper editors around the oil fields and a sound that was now old and familiar rushed by my ears. A new gusher, isn't it, Mrs. Cravat? Yes, another million dollars coming up out of the earth. Uh, how do they start them, with nitroglycerin? Yes, they lower it in a can. Oh. Uh, there's quite a crowd gathering over there. Some sort of excitement is going on. Let's walk over and see what it is. Hey, hey, you there. 
Can you tell us what's going on? We all just had a pretty narrow squeak, that's all. We almost got blown to perdition, all of us. What happened? They put 50 quarts of nitroglycerin into the gypsy pool, but the oil came up before the nitro got down. Oh, no! Well, what did they do about it? I never saw anything like it in my life. An old man caught it. Caught it? A man caught a 50-quart can of dynamite? That's right. They say he just ran back like an outfielder and gauged it with his eye while it was up in the air and run back like an outfielder and caught it. Well, how's the man? He's dying. His chest is all caved in. Who was he? What was his name? Oh, he's an old bum that's been doing odd jobs around the field. Name a Yankee or a... a... Yancey. Yeah, that's it, Yancey. Yancey! Yancey! Mrs. Cravat, you can't go over there. Let me by. Let me throw, I say. Let me throw. Oh, Yancey. Oh, dearest. Yancey. Sabra. Yancey. Sabra. Wife and mother. Stainless woman. Hide me in your love. Wife. Sleep. And mother. My dearest. Wife. My love. Sleep. Sleep. He slept at last in my arms. And in that manner, Yancey Cravat came home forever to the Cimarron. In a moment, James Hilton will return to tell you about next week's story. Meantime, I'd like to remind you that there's nothing like one of those colorful Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe to make a child's eyes light up with joy. There are 16 dolls in all, Little Miss Muffet, Cinderella, Little Boy Blue, and other childhood favorites. Each one wears a hat topped off by a jaunty plume that's a real feather. Each doll stands up by itself. And each one has a clever rhyme story about the doll inside. Children really love them. You couldn't ask for nicer favors for a children's party or more appropriate place cards than these unique Hallmark dolls. And these colorful, feather-hatted Hallmark dolls are just as grand for children who live far away from you as for those in your own home. Hallmark dolls, you see, are just as easy to send as any Hallmark greeting card. And they cost only 25 cents each. See all 16 of the charming and colorful Hallmark dolls tomorrow at the store where you buy your Hallmark greeting cards. Now, here again is James Hilton. After that great story of America, I want to compliment you, Miss Dunn, on a splendid performance. And for the makers of Hallmark Cards, our gratitude for your charming presence here this evening. Thank you, Mr. Hilton, for those nice words. But, of course, you Hallmark people specialize in nice words, both on your programs and on your greeting cards. So, naturally, I haven't been disappointed. But I enjoyed being here tonight. And please thank the Hallmark people for me and for all those nice words I've heard and seen. I shall do that, Miss Dunn. And Mr. Hilton, may I suggest to the Hallmark audience that they listen next week to your own great story, Goodbye, Mr. Chips, starring Ronald Coleman. Thank you, Miss Dunn. And so until next Thursday, when we welcome Ronald Coleman, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Gene Holloway with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Our producer-director is D. Engelbach. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards, when you care enough to send the very best. Now, this is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Goodbye, Mr. Chip, starring Ronald Coleman. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.